welcome to New York, the New Rochelle Public Library's Inside of History Selections from the Library's, Library's Archive. I'm Lisa Itzkowitz. I'm the Marketing and Communications Professional at the Library, and I'm thrilled to see so many of you here today. As you know, uh, we're going to dig into the Library's Archives today with the Libra Library's Archivist, David Rose. David is the Archivist of the New Rochelle Public Library. He's formerly archivist of the March of Dimes and Lou Esther T. Mertz Library of the New York Botanical Garden. He also has worked as a consulting archivist for the New York State Museum and John Cage Trust at Bard College. At the New, York, at the New Rochelle Public Library, he organizes and preserves document collections relating to New Rochelle dating from the 18th century to the present day. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David, who is going to take us through his presentation. Thanks very much, Lisa. I appreciate your introduction and welcome to all. Uh, I'm glad you're here for what will be about 50 minutes of archival slides. And um, I, have, uh, I have a prepared text today. So uh, I'm going to read from my text and you will see images from the library's archive. So this talk is about the history of our library and of New Rochelle. The library has been a cultural center and anchor institution for New Rochelle for about 129 years. The preservation of our history has been a community project that has developed over time in progressive growth of historical awareness. My talk today will focus on the history of the library from the perspective of our archive which has formerly been a part of our local history collection since 1938. The archive is a unique and special collection of documents and photographs, a treasury of history that allows us to preserve, preserve our achievements, to understand and face our problems, and to celebrate the cultural and intellectual diversity of our community. I find enormous enjoyment in organizing archival collections and writing about history. History is first and foremost about human beings, which is why I believe biography is one of the best entry points to understanding the complexities of the past. I'll discuss several individuals who have lived in New Rochelle. Some are famous, some not so famous, but vitally important nonetheless. There are several themes woven through this talk and they are as follows. The library is central to and intertwined with New Rochelle history actual archival documents scanned here for presentation, our community of artists and their artwork, cultural diversity with particular focus on Native Americans and how New Rochelle is connected to the world. I will begin with a poem and I will end with a poem. The first is by Ishmael Reed, one of our great American poets. Notice that his poem, Dualism, bears reference to Ralph Ellison's novel, Invisible Man. Dualism by Ishmael Reed. I am outside of history. I wish I had some peanuts. It looks hungry there in its cage. I am inside of history. It's hungrier than I thought. So how to understand this poem? The idea that history itself is secured in a cage evading our understanding is a powerful metaphor, but the realization that we are all in that cage inside of history can bring us to a realization of the full intensity of historical truth. It's hungrier than I thought. Almost all the slides in this talk are scans of documents and photos from our archive. This photo seems to project us through the mist of years to a simpler time. After the passage of a New York state law providing for the separation of public and school libraries, the New Rochelle Library opened in November, 1893. It was an immediate success. It was chartered in 1894 and found a temporary home at the New Rochelle Trust Company that then moved to the Masonic Building on Main Street in 1901. This pamphlet was the earliest library publication. There are literally hundreds of library publications organized and preserved in the library's own collection dating from 1893 to the present day. 
This is the first catalog of the library's holdings, a book by Augusta Leipold in 1897. Who was Augusta H. Leipold? I was intrigued by this question and I learned she was the wife of a famous 19th century book dealer and bibliographer, Frederick Leipold. How she came to catalog the New Rochelle collection remains a mystery, one that I aim to find out one day. I believe the librarian Melville Dewey had something to do with her involvement, but for now, this is an unsolved question. There are in excess of 10,000 photographic images in our archive. Most are in good condition, but some like this one have been subject to the ravages of time. All that we know here is that these children were students at the Winya Avenue School in 1905. Who were they? What were their names? We know nothing of them or who they became. In his essay on the concept of history, the philosopher Walter Benjamin stated, quote, it is more arduous to honor the memory of the nameless than that of the renowned. Historical reconstruction is devoted to the memory of the nameless, end of quote. Mayor Harry Colwell negotiated a $60,000 gift from in industrialist philanthropist Andrew Carnegie in 1910. With this, the New Rochelle Public Library opened its first freestanding library at the corner of Pintard Avenue and Main Street on May 11th, 1914. The library functioned as an educational center and context for community service and cultural expression. The Carnegie Library served the community for 65 years until 1979. One librarian called it a university of the people, giving it a rather populist tinge. After the Carnegie Library was established, it quickly evolved into a multifunctional community center. America's entry into the Great War in 1917 brought changes to the home front and to the library, and it was utilized by the Red Cross, by the Visiting Nurse Association and other organizations. The library promoted the purchase of Liberty Bonds to help the war effort with palm cards like this placed at the circulation desk. One conspicuous asset of the library was exhibit space for New Rochelle's active community of art artists. Several well-known illustrators and artists made their home in New Rochelle and by the early 20th century, an informal art colony began to take shape. The Association of Female Painters and Sculptors and the New Rochelle Art Association were but two organizations welcomed by the library. One of the early New Rochelle artists was Thomas Nast, an editorial cartoonist known as the father of the American cartoon. This one, Who Stole the People's Money, Do Tell, was one of the most famous political cartoons of its day, intended to pillory the massive corruption of the Tweed Ring in New York City. I selected this image not only to mention Nast, but to point out the crop marks from grease pencils one often finds on printed illustrations meant for publication. New Rochelle has often celebrated its founding by the French Huguenots, and there are many depictions of the Huguenot landing at Echo Bay in 1688. Such representations always, often portray Native Americans who were displaced by encounters with white Europeans. The landing of the Huguenots at New Rochelle by George Harker is a fiction that opposes the Huguenots as victims of persecution with Native Americans who are hostile and ready for attack. These were often called the Siwanoi Indians, but there was no such self-given name for the Aboriginal inhabitants of New Rochelle. Such invented identity by white Americans inevitably, inevitably placed them in a position of subservience. The artist Frederick Remington was a longtime resident of New Rochelle. His depictions of Native Americans of the West were rooted in the stereotype of the savage. Unlike George Catlin, an artist who attempted an authentic portrayal of the vanishing Aborigines in his art, Remington's portrayals were tainted with outright racism. The New Rochelle Art Association held its first art ex exhibition to celebrate the library opening in 1914. 
Annual art shows at the library were succeeded by exhibits of individual artists in the 1920s. The association's perspective was comprehensive and eclectic, and its exhibitions featured graphic arts, painting, sculpture, and arts and crafts. One notable project involved the creation of roadside approach signs on routes of entry into the city, still in existence today. This brochure from the 1950s by artist Rockwell Kent opens with the message, quote, this is only one of 100,000 prints filed in the picture collection of the New Rochelle Public Library. Pictures are available for pageants, costumes, advertising, illustration, window displays, models, decoration, and design, end of quote. Of course, this service has long been obsolete with the instant availability of images on the internet. Norman Rockwell's oil painting, The Land of Enchantment, first appeared in the Saturday Evening Post in 1934. The original is on permanent display in our children's room, a wonderful allegory on the enjoyment of books and the cultivation of the art of reading. Around the border are listed books in the canon of literature that Rockwell knew best. David Copperfield, Robinson Crusoe, Huckleberry Finn, Alice in Wonderland, and others. Rockwell understood that reading is experience for the imagination. The Thanhauser Film Studio was founded in New Rochelle in 1909, and it produced hundreds of silent films. The actress Florence Labadie was a major star for Thanhauser until her life was cut short in an auto accident in Osney. The rumor of her love affair with Woodrow Wilson has been debunked, but you can find plenty of speculation about that online. This photo from a collection of hundreds of still photos of Thanhauser actors reminds me of a familiar predicament whenever I try to bake my own bread. Even more interesting than the Thanhauser movie stars is this rare photo of the studio's machine shop and its workers. On the left is a drill press, on the right is a lathe. And above the man on the right, is a piece of schmutz that I could not re remove from the original photograph, try as I might. It looks like a little hors d'oeuvre there, but it, 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 it won't come off, the original. Benjamin Eli Smith was managing editor of the Century Dictionary, an American rival of the Oxford English Dictionary. He was a New Rochelle resident from the 1890s, a member of the Board of Education and motivating force behind the creation of the, New, the, the, New Rich, the Rochelle Park Association, a civic and property improvement association of one of our prominent neighborhoods. Smith helped to promote English spelling reform through the Simplified Spelling Board, the brainchild of industrialist Andrew Carnegie. Foreseeing that English would become a global language, Carnegie believed a phonetic alphabet would guarantee its world acceptance. And this is a letter from Carnegie to Smith in our archive. It reads, March 23rd, 1906, quote, Dear Mr. Smith, I've been reading the press notices. The reception given to our plan is warmer than expected. In thanking the Times, I asked it just to adopt though, that is T-H-O instead of T-H-O-U-G-H. And we should have a start. We must follow up this fine stroke, one word at a time, good fishing. Yours truly, Andrew Carnegie. However, things did not turn out as planned. And after 10 years, Carnegie was miffed. He wrote, a more useless body of men never came into association, judging from the effects they produce. I think I've been patient long enough. I have much better use for $20,000 a year. And of course he did. He helped us build, build the, the, the library at, at Pintard and Maine. So who were these, um, who were this use, useless, useless body of men? Well, they were Davis, David Brewer, he was a justice of the US Supreme Court. Nicholas Butler was president of Columbia University. Melville Dewey created the Dewey Decimal System. Isaac Funk was a lexicographer and founder of Funk and Wagnalls. Henry Holt founded the Henry Holt Company. William James was probably the most important American philosopher of the 19th century, a Harvard professor. Theodore Roosevelt, also on the board, was president of the United States, and who in the world ever heard of Mark Twain? I think that is hysterically funny that he says a more useless body of men never came into association. 
Now, in 1919, New York State passed legislation requiring mun mun municipalities to select a city historian. Since then, New Rochelle has had four city historians, and these are Florence Stegman, Edward Stitt, Thomas Hochtor, and Barbara Davis. Florence Stegman was installed <clears throat> in 1920. Edward Stitt was an attorney and member of the American History Club of New Rochelle. From 1955, Thomas Hochtor, sports editor for the Standard Star, filled the position for nearly half a century. And many of you know Barbara Davis, our current city historian and constant inspiration for those attracted to our history. In fact, our archive has an oral history interview of Thomas Hochtor by Barbara Davis and a selection of the Florence Stegman papers. The Great Depression of the 1930s had a disastrous effect on the nation and on New Rochelle, evidenced here in public auction notices of city-owned business properties. Again, these are scans of original from, originals from our archives. But a monumental step forward for the preservation of history occurred in the 1930s. The creation of the National Archives and Records Administration and the dedication of the National Archives building in Washington, DC. In the rotunda of this building are displayed the originals of the Charters of Freedom of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. The National Archives sets the standards for all archives and manuscript collections in the United States. And I believe it raised awareness in New Rochelle for the preservation of the city's history at the library. There are four sculptures at the National Archive with, with inscriptions that are worth noting. What is past is prologue. Actually, that's a quote from The Tempest by Shakespeare. Study the past. The heritage of the past is the seed that brings forth the harvest of the future. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Now these illustrations were used to decorate the official historical program for the city's celebration of its 250th anniversary in 1938. The monikers City of the Huguenots and Queen City of the Sound are conspicuous. But the gaudy triumphalism of these illustrations continues the repetitious fixation on the story of the Huguenots to the general neglect of the rest of New Rochelle history and it's brought a lasting conservatism to historical reconstruction. And note the inferior position of the Native American with his war club and bows and arrows in the, in the depiction on the right. The 250th anniversary in 1938 was a milestone event leading to the creation of the local history room at the library under the direction, under the leadership, I should say, of J. Marshall Purley, who is vice president of the New Rochelle Trust Company. And he worked on behalf of the Committee of the Friends of the Library at that time. The committee raised funds to formalize a local history room that would include an archive of documents. Many prominent residents in, in, endorsed this effort, including Carrie Chapman Catt, who is founder of the League of Women Voters, and Norman Rockwell. Their letters of support appear here. Rockwell's on the left reads, quote, I think the idea of a historical center in New Rochelle is certainly a fine one. I personally would only be too glad to do what I can to help. It would be a, of great educational interest to the people of New Rochelle, as well as a civic pride. Now I have a book on my shelf entitled, The Historian as Detective. One could very well imagine a book titled The Archivist as Detective. Sleuthing through documents is one of the great satisfactions of archival work and research. The document you see here is a vellum manuscript documenting a bankruptcy pr proceeding in London, England in 1726. It's the oldest document in our collection. Why is it here? How did it get here? We don't know. When the document is unfolded, it looks like this. Our archives volunteer, Oliver Hughes, recently took on the assignment of transcribing this entire document so that the text can be easily read. 
Oliver uncovered many interesting facts about the principles in this lawsuit, but we were never able to reach a conclusion as to its origin. Our archivists call this provenance, an important concept to demonstrate a record of ownership used as a guide to authenticity. Now, the first autos that crossed the bridge to Glen Island occurred in 1925. And even during the dire years of the depression, teens and college students flocked to the Glen Island Casino to dine and dance to the music of swing bands. One jazz history called the casino a teen center with broadcasting lines, which is pretty much what it was. It achieved national fame as the cradle of the name bands. The Dorsey brothers played at the Glen Island Casino and in one notorious incident, Tommy on trombone disagreed with his brother Jimmy on trumpet over the tempo of the tune, I'll never say never again, again. And in anger, Tommy walked off the bandstand, left the casino and never looked back. The brothers split each to form his own band. It was the most famous snit in jazz history right here at Glen Island. The jazz historian Gunther Schuller called the swing era, quote, that remarkable period in American musical history when jazz was synonymous with America's popular music. The only time when jazz was completely in phase with the social environment and when it both captured and reflected the broadest musical common denominator of popular taste in the nation, end of quote. The leaders of the swing era big bands were not just pop stars, they were heroes, and several launched their careers at the Glen Island Casino. One of these was Glenn Miller, who led the most commercially successful big band of the time. Moonlight Serenade and In the Mood were his signature tunes. In May 1939, he opened at the Glen Island Casino to a record-breaking crowd of 1,800 people that led him to eight number one hits in 1940. His orchestra performed at the Glen Island, at Glen Island from 1940 to 1942. And Glenn Gray led one of the popular white bands of the age, also performing many times at Glen Island. Now, here is a typical appreciation of the casino from our postcard collection advertising Claude Thornhill's orchestra. It reads, quote, Dear Tom, I got to the place of my dreams last night. It's beautiful overlooking the water, et cetera. Very romantic. Gee, life is wonderful. Swell orchestra and the atmosphere, ooh la la. Love, Rose, end of quote. Now, what is most striking to me about this romantic note of May 29th, 1942, is that Europe was then in the throes of the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century, World War II. It seems difficult to reconcile the naive innocence of this postcard message from Glen Island with the horrors of the Holocaust and the battles then raging between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, the citizens of New Rochelle expanded the annual philanthropy of its local community chest into welfare fundraising for war relief. In addition, there were appeals from the National War Fund to assist the victims of war and prosecution, persecution. In our publications collection, there are dozens of pristine original pamphlets that document the work of the National War Fund, a little known wartime agency that financed the USO and dozens of member agencies. Presumably a librarian or resident of New Rochelle took the trouble to collect and preserve these rare pamphlets. In our scrapbooks collection, there are five large volumes documenting the work of the National War Fund from 1942 to 1945. We also have records of military personnel and World War II propaganda posters among the artwork and memorabilia from the war years. Here are the images of a D-Day service program at the Trinity Episcopal Church and another National War Fund pamphlet, this one with artwork by Norman Rockwell bearing the legend each according to the dictates of his own conscience. In the aftermath of World War II, our library joined a local New Rochelle, La Rochelle committee 
that donated books to the library in La Rochelle, France. Their librarian, Olga de saint afrique who died in 2019 at the age of 103, expressed her gratitude in several letters, not only for the books, but for donations of clothing and food sent from the staff of the library. This correspondence includes letters and itineraries of visits between the sister cities of New Rochelle and La Rochelle. After the war, resident artists and musicians continued to lift our spirits through the agency of the New Rochelle Art Association and countless independent productions. One of these was the soprano Ella Bell Davis, a New Rochelle native whose career in art song rose from local productions to national and international prominence at Carnegie Hall and the Opera Nacional of Mexico City in the 1950s. She was the first African-American vocalist to, si to sing the role of Aida in Giuseppe Verdi's immortal opera. In our collection are her concert programs, photographs, and audio recordings that document her career. The F. Willia Davis Women's Club of New Rochelle was one of the oldest African-American women's club, clubs in Westchester County. Founded in 1909, it evolved from a mother's club of the Bethesda Baptist Church. As the Colored Women's Club, as it was then called, it affiliated with the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and was supported by the NAACP. It established a community house, provided housing and scholarships, becoming central to African-American activities in the community. It also sponsored concerts by Ella Bell Davis. The name F. Willia Davis Women's Club was adopted in 1958. Ugo Moki, a longtime resident of New Rochelle, was an illustrator and designer who gained prominence with silhouette art, shadows in outline. He was especially famous for animal silhouettes. Clockwise from his portrait are the art of the silhouette, a Christmas card, the Huguenot landing in New Rochelle, an instructional design pamphlet, and a study of praying mantises. Look closely there to find those marvelous insects. Here is Mr. Moki displaying his book, Hoofed Mammals of the World, at the Italian consulate in New York City in 1971. The Carnegie Library started a film service in 1947 and our bookmobile served the community for over two decades. We affiliated with the Westchester Library System in 1958. But as the physical vulnerabilities of the Carnegie Library became increasingly apparent, the library explored relocation. This parking lot facing the New Rochelle train station became part of the location of our present building. After years of study and planning, the New Rochelle Public Library opened at its present location at One Library Plaza on September 17, 1979. The building, part of which was repurposed from a former parking garage, was a model of adaptive reuse, and it gained the library the Award of Excellence for Library Architecture from the American Institute of Architects and the American Library Association in 1980. In 1989, the library was among the first in Westchester County to automate its collection. At the dedication, Ozzie Davis was the keynote speaker. In 1980, the journal Progressive Architecture ran a feature article on the library explaining how the architects integrated the library as a cultural center into the master plan of development for the city. The journal touted the library as its own best advertisement for encouraging the reuse of what already exists. The top right photo is a view of the library from what is now the parking lot of CVS. Our local history room was named for the novelist E.L. Doctorow in 1998. This list of resources presents the holdings of the local history room in relationship to the archive. And our microfilm collection includes several New Rochelle newspapers, the Pioneer, the Paragraph, the Press, the Evening Standard, and the Standard Star. Ossie Davis and his wife, Ruby D, were longtime residents of New Rochelle 
and is well known and respected for their civil rights activism as for their talents in theater and performance. Ozzie Davis was a playwright, author, and actor of stage and screen. He was involved in organizing the March on Washington in 1963. And he even wrote an award-winning children's book about young people in the civil rights movement titled Just Like Martin. After his death in 2005, the library named its theater in his memory, the Ozzie Davis Theater. And fittingly, the library green at the west side of the library is named Ruby D. Park. The library has featured countless exhibits in its first floor exhibit space, the Lumen Martin Winter Gallery. Lumen Martin Winter was an American public artist who lived in New Rochelle. He claimed that the first prize he ever received for his art was from the New Rochelle Art Association, and he later was its president. His earliest work includes murals for several post offices commissioned by the Works Progress Administration of the New Deal during the Great Depression. Few of us will have difficulty identifying this scene. A Macy's Thanksgiving Giving Day Parade with the balloon figure of Mighty Mouse towering over the crowd. The following several images from the Terry Tunes records are all from the library's archive. Paul Terry was a cartoonist, screenwriter, and film director. The Terry studio in New Rochelle created the characters Heckle and Jekyll, Deputy Dog, and Mighty Mouse. Here, Paul Terry discusses the artwork with one of his many cartoonists. I'm sure that Mighty Mouse will never eclipse Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse in American popular culture, and Terry himself recognized this. He said, quote, Walt Disney is the Tiffany's of the cartoon business, and I am the Woolworths, end of quote. This is a colored animation cell overlaid on a background pencil sketch. The animation cell is plastic that is warped and which you, which you can detect in the wavy patterns at the top of this image. There are dozens of such animation cell, cells in this collection. And here is an example of a background scene against which the animation takes place. This is a scan of original artwork in the library's Terry Toons records. This is the Terry Toons studio in Manhattan prior to its move to New Rochelle. Let's take a close look. It's a fascinating workplace scene. Several cartoonists are working at animation tables, which are rotating tables for sequencing artwork, much like a lazy Susan. But I'm at a loss to explain the commotion of men at the north end of this image, but the entire scenario begs for a clearer explanation. This photo is of Terry Toon's animators of New Rochelle. There was no caption with the original photo, so I don't know their identities, but I think we can agree this looks like a hard drinking crew of cartoonists having a good time. Now let's turn from the lowbrow to the highbrow. Maestro Arturo Toscanini was one of the most celebrated conductor of classical music of the 20th century. He was one of the greatest models of artistic integrity and excellence in the history of music. A strict constructionist of performance, he sought nothing less than perfection and magnificence. Of the first movement of Beethoven's Eroica Symphony, he famously stated, quote, to some it is Napoleon, to some it is Alexander the Great, to some it is philosophical struggle, to me it is Allegro con Brio, end of quote. But more than that, he was a fervent anti-fascist and was thanked by Jewish leaders for his refusal to conduct at the Wagner Festival in Bayreuth, Germany in 1933, after the Nazis came to power. He was thanked by President Roosevelt for his many benefit concerts during World War II. And the maestro also adored his grandson, Walfredo Toscanini, seen here on the left. Walfredo Toscanini was a Democratic Party activist library board member, city councilman, and deputy mayor of New Rochelle. He was an architect who worked for New Rochelle for, for New York State and in private practice. He strove to preserve and promote the artistic legacy of his grandfather. The music historian Alan Steckler wrote in liner notes to the complete Toscanini RCA Victor collection, quote, this collection is dedicated to the memory of Alfredo Toscanini 
no one devoted more time and energy to the, member, the memory of his grandfather, Maestro Arturo Toscanini. No sweeter man ever lived, end of quote. The political history of New Rochelle has yet to be written. The library's archive is filled with documents of the city government and its political leaders. And one day I'm sure it will find its historian. Among many essential records is a set of city council minutes in 163 volumes. The letters presented here relate to the leadership of Walfredo Toscanini. The first on the left is from Mayor Frank Garrido, February 10th, 1975. Quote, Dear Wally, there are so many important issues before us, such as Community Development Act, New Library, David's Island, Freight Yard, Rudat Study, the filling of Assessor's Post and Department of Parks and Recreation, and most important, I feel it is imperative that we meet to expedite the selection of a city manager." End of quote. The second letter is from Sidney Mudd, chairman of the board of New York's 7-Up of New Rochelle, sending regrets when Toscanini lost a re-election to city council, November 9th, 1977. Quote, Wally, I am truly sorry that our, all your hard work did not carry the day. We won't let you rest long. There is plenty to do no matter what. Gratefully, Sid, end of quote. It's not unusual for a newly acquired collection to arrive at the library in, let us say, not archival packaging. This is one of several metal boxes and plastic bins of documents recently donated by the family of Elizabeth Huntington Coley Fox, an artist and school teacher who resided in New Rochelle from 1928 to 1951. I am currently organizing the Coley Fox papers, which includes hundreds of letters to and from family and friends, diaries and journals, and the memorabilia of New Rochelle. Elizabeth Coley was a native of Utica, New York. Her Reverend Edward Huntington Coley, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Central New York. She was a life member of the Art Students League of New York, and as a young adult, she made a grand tour, not only of Europe, but the burgeoning art colonies of Greenwich Village, Woodstock, New York, and Provincetown, Massachusetts. In 1928, she married John Futhi Fox, a marine engineer and expert in diesel engine design at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Elizabeth and Futhi, as he was known, were invited to several ship launches at the Navy Yard during World War II. In Elizabeth's papers are the sermons of her father, Bishop Coley, along with her own reflections on life and belief. Blending Chinese and Christian ideas, she wrote, quote, the good I meet with goodness, the bad I also meet with goodness. Thus I obtain goodness because I make it real. The faithful I meet with faith, the faithless I also meet with faith. Thus I obtain faith because I show that it is real. End of quote. She was a member of the Mother's Club of New Rochelle and supported the Maternal Health Center of New Rochelle, which was a precursor to Planned Parenthood. Elizabeth exhibited her artwork with the New Rochelle Art Association, the New Rochelle Public Library, and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Her correspondence with Episcopal missionaries in China spans two decades, and she supported the educational work of Ramakrishna and Marguerite Modak to familiarize Americans with the cultures of India. Elizabeth carried on an utterly fascinating correspondence with Chief Crazy Bull, Tatanka Witko, grandson of the famous Lakota Sioux leader, Sitting Bull. A graduate of Yale University, Tatanka Witko adopted the name William Jacobs, he often appealed to Elizabeth for warm coats and clothing that he shipped to the Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. He gave frequent presentations on Sioux culture and history, once at the Trinity Church, of which Elizabeth was a member. Another fascinating collection recently acquired is the papers of Oliver Smalley, a metallurgist who advanced the process to improve the integrity and strength of cast iron. 
The process was invented by George Meehan in 1923 and Smalley developed an engineering process, a marketing platform and international patents to license the Meehanite process in iron foundries and mills worldwide. The Meehanite Metal Corporation had its home office on North Avenue opposite Iona College in the 1950s. There were never any steel mills like this in New Rochelle, but Smalley's papers and photos document in the finest detail the science and history of the metal casting industry. This light beam splitter is one of the many interest instruments used in Smalley's research. The resulting images of crystalline structures in iron might be worthy of a prize in a science photography contest. There are dozens of brochures of New Rochelle businesses in our archive, from the eye-catching artwork of Republic Color, and even a stock certificate of the New Rochelle Development Company in 1906. Manager Charles Strom donated a superb collection of records documenting the redevelopment plans of the city, including zoning changes, construction of parking garages, reconfiguration of traffic, repair of roads and drainage, and the improvement of business opportunities in the business district. One project was the Keystone Revitalization Pro Program, a study which was commissioned by the New Rochelle Downtown Association in 1957. Antonio Valencia was a Mexican immigrant who worked as a housekeeper for Mayor George Vergara in 1954. He utilized his friendship with the mayor to assist friends and family to settle in New Rochelle. Hundreds did so and he was lionized by the transplanted Mexican community as El Padrone. In 1999, the library joined in several studies and celebrations of the local Mexican community and developed the Antonio Valencia Local History Collection through a New York State Documentary Heritage Grant. This photo from the collection depicts a scene in Michoacan, Mexico in 1957, a birthday party for the girl seated on the far right and her parents stand at the left. In 2009, the library received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to host a reading event, The Big Read, that featured author and New Rochelle resident, Cynthia Ozick. Her book, The Shawl, is a harrowing, unforgettable short story combined with a novella about an incident during the Holocaust. Cynthia Ozick tells that the Shawl was inspired by a line from William Shire's The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which prompted her to address this unspeakable evil against the Jews and Judaism. The Big Read was designed to restore reading to, to the center of American culture. The New Rochelle Public Library Foundation is a volunteer fundraising and advocacy organization founded in 1993 on the library's 100th anniversary. This number of the foundation's newsletter in 1916, I'm sorry, 2016, features a quotation by my colleague, Daniel O'Geary, technology coordinator for the library, referring to computer upgrades in the children's room, teen room, and digital media lab made possible by the foundation Daniel stated, quote, we envision a place where kids gather to make Lego robots and teens create digital music, games, and videos. Students learn to invent, engineer, and build projects. Adults create prototypes for business applications with laser cutters and 3D printers, end of quote. The library's archival collections would not exist without the generosity of donors of documents and memorabilia. One of the most memorable is Dominic Bruzis, a longtime New Rochelle resident, employee of the Department of Public Works and member of the New Rochelle Police Department. Fascinated with history, Mr. Bruzis photographed city scenes and collected photographs for six decades from the 1940s. This includes his police experience with the documentation of crime scenes, traffic accidents, and police department functions. He added a historian's perspective to the routines of police reportage and documented the built environment and public life of New Rochelle, including trolley transportation, 
city parks, churches, hospitals, and schools, nautical subjects on Long Island sounds, and public events such as parades, carnivals, and art exhibits, as well as the city's Huguenot heritage and the legacy of Thomas Paine and the Paine Cottage. Ironically, we have but a single photograph of a man himself, but here he is in this one, and we salute him. Karen Allen was an author and amateur historian whose interest in music and local history led to the creation of an original opera, The Gentle Lark of New Rochelle, which debuted at the library's Ossie Davis Theater in 2007. She was a longtime supporter and steadfast volunteer of the library, adding numerous treasures of New Rochelle memorabilia to our collections, many purchased at her own expense. She was co-founder of Tutti Bravi Productions with Billy Tucker, formerly community relations coordinator at the library, and she was author of Lo, Hear the Gentle Lark, a biographical account of the life of Ella Bell Davis. Karen's success with these productions stands as an exemplary artistic breakthrough, presenting our community to the world, just as E.L. Doctorow's Ragtime did four decades earlier. For this and for her friendship and for her passion for the library, we salute her. Joseph Mitchell, a chronicler, a chronicler of street life in New York City during the Great Depression, once remarked, history has been obliterated, but somehow it's still here. I believe that idea is captured perfectly in the photo of Trinity Church against the background of a high rise building. These are the competing claims of the past upon the present and the present upon the past. The buildings continue to rise high in New Rochelle, but we intend to preserve our history for future generations in our archive, which holds the records of the League of Women Voters, Rotary Club, New Rochelle Opera, Long Island Sound Study, Art Association, Council on the Arts, Women's Club, and much more. And by the way, there's a fast food restaurant in La Rochelle, France called 325 New Rochelle, presumably named for the 325th anniversary of the founding of New Rochelle observed by both cities. So this is my definition of an archive, a rationally organized space in which monotonous, boring collections of documents are kept is really a place full of labyrinthine mysteries, hidden chaos, unexpected adventures, fascinating stories, and the intricate pulsations of history. What thrills me about archival work is that the process of discovery never ends. I will close with a poem, actually two poems, by New Rochelle native George Oppen. Oppen was born in New Rochelle and first published poetry with the objectivist poets, including Louis Zukovsky. His political activities during the Great Depression got him into hot water with the House Un-American Activities Committee, but in the 1960s, he returned to poetry and won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1969. A poetry of the meaning of words and a bond with the universe. I think there is no light in the world but the world, and I think there is light. And now his poem, Birthplace, New Rochelle. Returning to that house and the rounded rocks of childhood, they have lasted well. A world of things. The knuckles of my hand, so jointed. I am this? The house, my father's once, and the ground. There is a color of his times in the sun's light a generation's mark, it intervenes. My child, not now a child, our child, not altogether alone in a lone universe that suffers time like stones in sun, for we do not. To conclude, I'll extend my thanks to the staff at the library. All of my colleagues are gracious, super smart, and very dedicated people. I work most closely with Larry Sheldon and Patricia Perito to organize and preserve our collections. And we have a lot of fun together along the way. 
Barbara Davis continues to educate and inspire me and I turn to her again and again. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks to Roger and Judy Hyman for the Oliver Smalley papers, to Susan Metrano for the Elizabeth Coley Fox papers, and to city manager Chuck Strom for the Nearshell city manager records. Special thanks to Al Achoy who did me a solid by hauling a huge collection of heavy, heavy records back to the library one day, and to our volunteer Oliver Hughes who transcribed a 300 year old document. It was a ton of work and he did a great job. Thanks to all. And with that, I conclude. Thank you, David, that, that was amazing. Um, and I hope will be the first of, I won't say many because I can only imagine the time it took for you to put that together, but of more um, peeks into the archive and the, the fascinating treasures that it holds. If anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, I haven't seen any come in. I will tell you, I put a link in the chat to our local history page on our website. A recording of today's presentation will be posted there and you can also find past presentations. Oh, and I do have a question, let's see. Before the question comes up, I'd also like to say thanks to everyone who attended today. I really appreciate your support. You see my contact information, my email address on the lower left of this slide. So if you have any questions that aren't answered now, you can contact me and um, I'll be more than happy to help, always. Okay, the question um, Trish is asking, who is the artist of the opening and closing slides? Good question. Merle Perlmutter, a New Rochelle artist. I know nothing about her. Barbara Davis probably knows a lot, but I, uh, I have to give her credit for that. They're really pretty wild, aren't they? Merle anything Perlmutter. Else? Barbara, want to chime in with anything? I, I know she was on. Um... Yeah, I'll unmute myself. Yes, Merle was a member of the uh, Nourishell Art Association, longtime member um, and uh, a resident of Nourishell. Uh, I don't want to add much. I, I loved her work, still love it, um, and I'm glad you could find it. I'm just curious, David, where, where are these images? Where, where, where are they located? There are, there are, th the, I showed two of three that are original eight by 10 prints in an unmarked file. Now they're marked, Merle Perlmutter, because I was, I was totally taken by um, the unusual beauty of these, um, these contorted images. Yeah, she, she was an amazing artist. Um, and I can give you some more information about her. So yeah, I'd like, uh, to, I'd like and, to hear at some point. The, all okay, the I'll just pipe in. This was fabulous um, to bring our archives into the public like this. I salute you. Thank you. Um, Thanks, for Barbara. those of you who don't know David, he is like a true Renaissance man. And <laughs> the Nourish Public Library is so lucky to have him because he's not only an archivist, which normally you think of a guy or a person sitting around a table and doing these things. He has a breadth of knowledge about all kinds of things, including philosophy, including mushrooms, including jazz. And that all came out in the uh, presentation. Um, I was delighted to see uh, Wally Toscanini's um, uh, <laughs> um, archives uh, featured because I was there in the house as it was just about to be sold and I'm putting those in boxes. So hallelujah to you for that. And for Thank some you. of the other, the more recent archives because I know as the schlepper, I'm so pleased that they were put in good hands and that they are at the library. And I encourage anybody who's listening or anybody who knows people, this is where your documents can be preserved, protected, and made public. Um, uh, that is the most important thing. And the Nourishell Public Library is above and beyond all other public libraries in Westchester County um, in this regard. So salutes to the NRPL. And I'm signing off now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. I, I really you, Barbara. appreciate your saying that. That's very important to say. And, um, you know, Barbara has lived New Rochelle history. I'm just catching up with it. 
but we continue our mutual admiration society. So thank you. All right, I just want to, if I, I don't see any more questions, I just want to encourage everyone to visit our website and our online calendar to see additional great programs we have coming up. I'll mention a few. On May 1st, we have Acting Shakespeare, which we are uh, presenting in partnership with the New Rochelle, um, oh my God, I'm, I'm NERCA. <laughs> Teresa, don't kill me, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the full name. New Rochelle Council on the Arts, thank you. On May 13th, we're gonna have an all-female acapella group singing. That's a Friday evening, something new for us. And on May 14th, we're gonna have another historical presentation this time on Freedom Land. For, so for those of you who um, know the Bronx and Co-op City and what was there before, it should be an inter interesting presentation. Also, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention next week, we have a full week of children's activities because the schools are closed. So we have something going on every morning and af afternoon, um, the paper bag players, we have a magician and lots of, um, of great things for children. And on May 12th, we have the New Rochelle Public Library Foundation Gala. So that is another great way to show your support for our library. Um, the, the foundation does so much to make uh, so much possible in the library. And we'd love to see everyone, everyone out. Um, and it's back in person, so a, a fun gathering. I, I think that's it, David, anything else? I said what I had to say. Actually, I do have, there's an encore. <laughs> this is it, I, two more slides. Okay. You, you know, uh, Norman Rockwell has portrayed folksy Americana throughout his entire career, but I, I discovered this. This is the record cover of the live adventures of Mike Bloomfield and Al Cooper by Norman Rockwell. And I, I, I append this to my talk because I just think it's so cool. Mike Bloomfield was a superb blues guitarist for the electric flag. Al Cooper founded Blood, Sweat and Tears and went on to uh, an illustrious career in rock music. These two played with Bob Dylan on his classic album, Highway 61 Revisited, one of the most famous rock songs of all time, like a Rolling Stone, Al Cooper, on organ, Mike Bloomfield on guitar. And this is uh, by, this portrait is by Norman Rockwell. And here they are. Yeah. I think this is the sweetest photograph. Al, I mean, all geniuses in art in their own way, Al Cooper and Mike Bloomfield with Norman Rockwell, 1968. So all of you fans of rock music in the sixties, uh, I, I leave you with this. It's a, a great encore. Thank, Thank you, you everyone for, for joining us and we hope to see you back in the library at library programs and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, everyone.